All right, everybody, day three, just back from lunch. Everyone's excited, full, looking forward to dinner tonight for all you attendees. So everyone out there that's watching, just go to the fridge and get a sandwich. Now, coming up next, we have a great treat for you guys here. Speaking on the three pillars of seductive success, Australia's number one attraction coach, James Marshall. Good afternoon, gentlemen. How are we all? The thing about the British is they're so fucking polite. How are we all? Good. That's very good. One thing I've noticed is that anywhere that was colonised by the British Empire tends to have issues with picking up girls. Have you noticed that there's uh, very little in the way of seduction coaching going on in France and Spain and Portugal and Brazil? Uh, there's, there's a reason why we're not going to set up business over there because we would be having way too much fun and be out of business real quick. Um, I'll give you an example of this. I was dating a, a French model for some time and uh, she had to go back to France uh, to attend to something. And uh, she was calling me from a public phone box. We were chatting away and then I hear this scuffling noise this, this, and then there's a man's voice. And I hear her speaking. And I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And she said, oh, it's, uh, it's okay. A man just uh, pushed his way into the uh, cubicle and said, you are very charming. I would like to take you out on dinner. And I was just there like, he did what? <laughs> and this is when I was like a professional pickup coach and I was thinking I was pretty cool. But I've never done that. Has anyone else pushed their way into a phone box to ask a girl out on a date? <laughs> That's pretty fucking alpha. But what you'll notice is the guys there um, have to work way harder because the girls are used to this. That's why French guys clean up when they come to places like this. I think the reason why a lot of, uh, a lot of guys have a lot of trouble in this area, primarily this has been touched on by other speakers, is because they don't own the fact that they have a cock. They, they feel a little bit ashamed about it. And uh, we're taught from a whole variety of sources to hide the fact that we have a penis um, I had, a, I had a, cl a client recently who said, oh, well, if you're, um, if you're say, dancing with a girl and you, um, he couldn't even say it, like, are you trying to tell me you're dancing with a girl and you get an erection? He's like, yeah, that's, that's what I meant. <laughs> what do you do? He's like, should I sort of like, go like, put it out like this? <laughs> and I said, no, you should pull her in by the hip and pull her in and hold your fucking cock on her, on her hips. He's like, but then she'd know that I'm like, eh. <laughs> now she knows. And it was, he had this epiphany. It's like, she knows that I, and therefore the, uh, makes sense. Own, owning your desire is, is the core of what makes you successful in this area of your life. Men who are balls out get results. In Australia, we have one seduction technique. Uh, now, I do not necessarily endorse this technique because it's ugly, but it works. It's called the Aussie lean, right? So in Australia, when you're fucking going out to get a root, the first thing you do is you go out and you get real pissed, which you guys do, tick. And then you fucking watch some sport, which you guys also do. And then when you get onto the chicks, you just come over and you're like, here you go, and you just lean on her. <laughs> yeah? And the force of gravity means that uh, eventually she'll, she'll probably just give in because it's easier to have sex with you than to try and push a large Australian man off you. Yeah? Now, as I said, this is, this is not what I, I definitely do. But this works because the intent is clear. It's, it's ugly, it's, it's brutal, but it, it works. Whereas the um, polite gentleman who goes up and has a pleasant chat about um, topics and interests and so on, goes basically nowhere for a number of reasons, which we'll get into. Now, when I'm teaching what is, what is called natural seduction, okay, so now I definitely was not always natural at this, and this is something a lot of guys think when they meet me because I'm very confident, I'm charismatic, I know how to look people in the eye and fuck them in the brain with my eye contact, uh, that I was always that way. But I definitely wasn't. I'm self-taught natural, and, the adv and I've hung out with a lot of guys who are way better than me when it comes to picking up girls. Um, you know, I'm, I'm voted Australia's best dating coach and best natural. Um, 
using a, uh, an election process that's similar to an African election, I guess. Um, not necessarily indicative of the actual realities, but I'm definitely the best dating coach when it comes to natural game. Because the difference between me and some of my friends is that they don't know how or why it works. And so they'll say things like, what was one beautiful quote, um, man, fuck whole. That was, that was like the entire um, description of, of the, the method. And for a natural, that's, that's all it is. It's because anything else that doesn't go with that reality doesn't exist. And anyone who doesn't understand that, it's, it seems very, very confusing. But I went through a very long and arduous process to get to the point where what I do is freeform and natural. But because I was able to go through that entire process, I understand the stages that all you guys are at and will be at in the future, which is the advantage in my, my teaching. So let me tell you a little bit about the genesis of me as, as, as a great ladies' man. Um, was anyone here bullied at school? You know? I know you were. What do they call you, Sasha? Oh, and look at him now. We all want to talk to him. Okay, I was, I was savagely bullied at school because um, I was quite good at music, classical music, as a, as a young man, and I went to a very sporty school. And my mother read a book called The Right Instrument for Your Child. And uh, it was based on, you know, your physique and your temperament, and, and then they would choose an instrument for you, and this would be the right one for you. Apparently, due to the fact that I was waif-like and, and nervous, the flute was the right instrument for her child, um, which, as you all know, is one of the sexiest and manliest instruments available. And so I studied the flute, and I became quite good at it. And as a result, I got beaten up a lot at school because I didn't fucking like that because that's a poofter's instrument, and instruments in general poofters, but definitely the flute one is a poof instrument. And so I went home to my mother, and you know, I was crying because, you know, with my flute bent, and, and bruised and so on. I'm like, the guys are beating me up. And she's like, you know what? You should just hit them back. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do that. So the, uh, the next afternoon or the next time uh, a group of large, savage um, Australian kids came at me, I went to one of them, and then they beat me up a lot harder. <laughs> and uh, so it didn't really work. But what I did do then is I did seek out martial arts teachers. I decided that originally I got into it because I wanted to learn how to not get beat up so much because this nose, if it ever gets broken, is going to ruin my beautiful face and I cannot afford that because then I'd have to rely on my charm. And um, so I started doing martial arts at a, at a young age and this along with music became my obsession. And I was lucky enough to find some very, very traditional Shaolin Kung Fu teachers in, in Australia, believe it or not, and decided to follow that and see where it would lead me. Now, I'm going to be talking a little bit later about lifestyle design because I think that's an area that tends to get neglected in this field. And it's one of the best ways to get laid, to have awesome experiences, to create opportunities in your life, is to engineer a lifestyle that is attractive because then it becomes a machine for drawing people into you. It's not the only thing that you have to do. You, have to, you do need to know how to be able to go out there, uh, meet strangers on the street or wherever it is and draw them into your life. But if you don't have an amazing life to draw them into, if they're, I hate to say this word, high value, if they're women with high self-esteem that lots of people want to be around, then they want to be around guys who've got something going on. Yeah. So many years later, I, I went to China to study Chinese medicine. And if you, want to, if you want to study at Shaolin Temple, if you want to study Kung Fu there, you, you can't just rock up. You can't just turn up and go, teach me. There's, there's a very, very strict process. You have to be at a certain point in a lineage and uh, you have to, you know, have worked your ass off for 10 years plus before anyone's going to accept you in there. Now, I was over studying Chinese medicine and I decided at the end of that to just go and check out the temple. I knew that it wasn't, wasn't my turn or anything, but I just thought I'd go and fucking check it out. So I rocked up at this place, which, which to me was, the, which was the, the most amazing place that I could ever go to. So, you know, if whoever your mentors are, whoever your heroes are, imagine going to that place on the other side of the world and being finally there in the, in the presence of these people. And I rocked up and I, and I walked around the, tur uh, the, the temple with all the other Chinese and Western tourists and checking it all out and going, you know, one day I would love to just come back here and, and really fucking do this properly. And then I missed the last bus. Out of, out of that temple. And so there was nowhere for me to stay. 
and it was a nice summer's evening, so I decided to buy a rice mat and uh, take my bamboo flute and go and sit and meditate on the mountain and sleep the night there. And I was, I was walking along, a Chinese lady came up to me and she said, uh, how do I say, I've forgotten all my Chinese, where it, Zai Nan Is that all right? Zai Nan Where are you going? Yeah, okay, going. He's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> hey? True, all right, I'll just make up Chinese words. All right. She said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to the mountain. And she said, no, 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 come and stay at my place. And then, she, and then when we were halfway there, then she like, said it's going to be very expensive, which is, you know, good Chinese businesswoman. And um, asking, me what, asking me what I do, I said, oh, well, I'm, I, I study Gung Fu, or Shui Gung Fu. I would love to study here with this particular teacher. And she just, her eyes lit up, and, she, and I told her who my teacher was in Australia, and she ran off. And then five minutes later, coming down the mountain was the Chao, who is the monk that I had always dreamed to, to meet. And he's, he's my height, a huge Mongolian with a massive beard and carrying a monk spade, which is this huge thing with blades on either end, just like in a movie, walking down the road. I'm like, oh my God, it's De Chao. And he comes up to me. There had been some misunderstanding. She thought that I knew someone that I, well, that I did know, but that I was higher up than I was. He asked who I was. He looked me dead in the eyes. And I said, actually, I'm nobody. And he said, what do you want? He looked me in the eyes and asked me that. And in that moment, I had the choice. I could say, well, you know, I just came to check it out. Uh, so, you know, sorry for bothering you, sir. And I said, I want to study with you. And then he looked me in the eyes, held my gaze for a very long time and said, tomorrow, 5 a.m. And so the next morning, I rocked up at Shaolin Temple at 5 a.m and began my training with my hero. The people who get success in life in whatever area are the ones who just go out and fucking take it. The ones who sit back and plan and wish and dream, stay that way. And you guys have seen example, many examples of this over the conference, of guys often who are incredibly young who have achieved amazing things in their lives, who fast-tracked well past other people who may even be uh, better qualified in the area, but didn't have the balls to just go out there and take it. I had a very, very clear dream. I wanted that more than anything else. And I found myself, by good karma or some circumstances or whatever it was, in a situation where I had one shot. And so straight away, I called my teacher back in Australia and I explained, look, uh, I've been offered to train tomorrow morning with De Chao and I know I'm not supposed to be here but he's like all right do not fuck this up Jamie you got one shot at this and so I took it and I didn't fuck it up and it changed the course of my life because what I learned there uh, and in my subsequent visits and my all the training that I did before and after that gave me what I describe as the basis for my success in this area I didn't realize at the time when I was in this temple hitting rocks and meditating and swinging weapons around that I was actually learning to become a, an amazing ladies man. But I was because I was developing the foundations of charisma, of presence, of intent, of a core understanding of who I, I actually am. And when guys talk about this in the seduction community about, okay, well, be yourself, that's in some ways the the best and the worst advice you can ever give somebody. It's, it's, it's way too ambiguous to really make any sense. It's like, be yourself, well, when are you not yourself? Are you guys being yourselves right now? Some, they're like, I don't know, am I? It's getting all too existential for me. Uh, we're always being ourselves, but what we're actually not being is we're not being all of ourselves. And we have generally a fairly limited idea of what it is to be ourselves. I always tell guys, find out what else you are. Because you're an infinite being with amazing potential. You can try and be and do anything. There are all sorts of behaviors that maybe you haven't tried yet, which you can, which you can try out. And that's why when I get guys coming and saying, well, I, I, you know, I, I like the idea of direct, but that's just not me. Or I, I like the idea of sort of letting go of the lines and, and sort of being more natural, but it, I just feel like that's not really me. That's bullshit. That's simply that you haven't experienced that part of yourself yet. And sure, there will be some things that are not you, 
but as other speakers have said, we'll test that out a few times and see where it takes you. In, in my mind, the, the first thing that you must have in order to, be, to move towards being natural with women is you must have presence and awareness. This is the first thing I teach guys. I, I, like all the, all the companies, we get guys in with the chicks. It's like, you want to fuck chicks? Come, on, come over here, we got chicks. And then when they come in, they suddenly find themselves meditating and they're like, I'm like, is this, are we getting chicks yet? I'm like, patience. First, understand self, then girl, come. Because if you're, if you're not actually present and aware in the moment, then you cannot be natural with a girl. If you're thinking ahead to the next two or three or four things that you're going to say, then you won't notice all the important things. Because the way I seduce women is I, I let them teach me how to seduce them. Every single one of them is, is slightly or on a bigger level different than the other one which is why a, a one-size-fits-all linear model for seduction is never going to work. It's possibly going to work for the guy who invented it with his particular type of girls, but it's not going to work in general. And I'm not interested in what might work some of the time. I'm interested in the principles behind what works consistently. And that's what you guys want, right? You want consistency with your results? Yeah? I look at the, there, there's, there's kind of two major schools of seduction and, and there's, there's a lot of debate about this, okay, indirect versus direct or, you know, scripted versus uncanned or, you know, slightly poached or whatever else. And the way I see it, that there's only two types. There's principle-based and there's technique-based. Yeah? A technique-based system, and this goes for many, many, many other disciplines, and I got this idea originally from martial arts, was that a technique-based system says that when A happens, you do B, okay? When D happens, you do E. And in order to have any success, you're going to have to have a contingency plan for every single eventuality. And that's really, really impossible to do effectively and consistently in seduction because there's so much variation in what might happen. If you've got it in your head that you need to go up with some particular uh, line, and then the girl doesn't re respond in the way that she's supposed to, what do you do then? When I was speaking in, in LA last year, we had a couple of girls who were helping us with promo, and um, during the break, one of the guys came up and tried this opener, and he, so he's like, hey, you look like a horse girl. Do you like horses? <laughs> and, and the girl says, no, I don't like horses. And he's like, so you like horses, right? Okay, cool. So, and, and then he tried it again the next day, the exact same line. She's like, are you asking me again if, if I like horses. And he, could, he couldn't enter into his head. It's like, well, it says in the book, uh, when I say that, she says yes, because all girls like horses, and then therefore you can roll on with your routine. But it didn't work that way, and obviously didn't get the result that he was after. Um, I had another client who lives in Czech Republic, an expat there. And uh, he was doing a particular program which gave him a line, which was one of these, you know, unbreakable lines, you know, they, that someone has been working away in a laboratory for, for six years and has fi found this line. This is the line. Yeah, and that's what everyone's like waiting for. It's like, it's coming. It's coming. It says on the website, it's coming 48 days and counting. Uh, this line went something along the lines of, <clears throat> yo, girls, do you know Heather? Yeah, she's a really cool chick. I puked on her last summer and then we made out. Hey, let's fuck, or something like this. Yeah. Um, now, that might work in a frat house in the States, maybe, I don't know. Um, so this guy gets it, and then he translates it into Czech. He's like, okay, you girls like no Heather, and then goes up to a girl in the streets of Prague and tries that line. <sighs> Ooh, nasty. And he was really, really confused why she spat on him and then turned on her, on her like incredibly high heels and strutted off down the cobblestones away from his life forever. Because he didn't understand what, what he thought was, and this is not his fault, is because guys are sold the idea that the content of the line is what is, what is going to unlock the vagina, right? That somewhere within these words is the, uh, is the answer, and it's not true. The content is, is very rarely of much importance. It's the, the principles underlying it that, that actually make the difference.
Okay, so Sasha's a, f a funny man. We, we all enjoyed his speech previously, yeah? And I've been wanting to meet him for a long time. I've been really enjoying his stuff. And uh, what I was thinking about when I was, when I was watching him was, uh, was here's an example of a principle that we teach at The Natural Lifestyles, which is the concept of pressure and release. I, I pump a lot of pressure onto people when I meet them, girls and guys. Yeah? I have an ability to lock eyes with somebody and draw a lot of investment out of them. It's because I'm very, very demanding with the people that I'm with. I demand their attention. And a good comedian does this really, really well. I mean, why is a, why is a, what's, what's a, a bad comedian? How do you describe a bad comedian? Yeah, he's not funny. <laughs> His jokes aren't any good. Yes, all right. But how do you know when someone's not a good comedian? Yeah, okay, all right, a bunch of these things. Loose tension. Yeah, really what, what there is, is there's the lack of tension in the room. And the, the easiest way to spot this is when a comedian laughs at their own jokes, which is why I hate David Letterman. He's not funny. I don't like him at all. Because um, he's so fucking smug and thinks he's so good. He's not. He's not funny at all. People just think he's funny because he's on that show. Now... The reason, the reason a comedian in that situation is not good is because they do not know how to hold pressure on their audience. Their job is to confuse, intrigue, and create a build-up of tension and to be able to hold that pressure till exactly the right moment. And then when it's the right moment, then they drop the punchline. And if the audience hasn't been able to predict it or it's, it's clever, then they get that sensation, the feeling of a release of tension which they do by laughing. The bad comedian steals the job of the audience, which is to laugh, to, to release the pressure. In the same way, you'll see this, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crossover. You'll see this with guys who um, can't, can't handle pressure on themselves and can't handle putting pressure on somebody else, is that when they're in, in an interaction with a girl, they will be nervously laughing. They will be smiling too much. They will be agreeing with everything. They will be speaking way too fast. They'll be moving a whole lot. And there's a whole range of, of uh, behaviours and nuances that release pressure and create pressure. When I, when I open, I usually open with a couple of words and then I wait and see what happens. Yeah. Now, I don't want to pick on you, but the other day when I was sitting down with those girls and you came over, I'll give you a little bit of uh, feedback here of why you blew yourself out. Because they didn't blow you out, you blew yourself out. Yeah, which is totally fine. And props to him because he was the only one who had the balls to come over and try and join. Yeah. When I went over to those girls, I, I opened with, I don't know, they were cleaning up some beer cans and I said, oh, have they left you to clean up? And don't write that down because it's, it's like, okay, use that one. <laughs> All right. I was, just making, I was just making an observation and as I said that, I sat down. And then one of the girls is like looking at me all weird because like she's 19 and there's a whole range of her friends around and there's this like this old hairy dude's come and sat down next to them. And, um, and I'm totally fine with that. I, I can sit in that tension all day. It doesn't bother me at all. Yeah? And so I'm sat down and, and there's no way I'm leaving. And it's going to be much easier for them to put up with me and get, engage with me than it is to try to dislodge me. And people will tend to do what's easiest. Yeah? So if you make it really easy on a girl to... Uh, to brush you aside, then she probably will. If you make it harder, it's easier for her to stay and deal with you, then you're gonna be able to lock in much more easily. Yeah? So what you did is, by that time in the conversation, we were, we were quite deep into things, and you came on in and you sort of didn't quite sit down, you sort of almost sat down and said, oh, so guys, uh, you know, what's good tonight? And just started saying stuff. And the girls were looking like, because it didn't look like we knew each other, didn't, it had, there was no context, it made no sense, you were, you were saying stuff and they, of course, didn't respond straight away and so you got freaked and you left. Yeah. Yeah? All right. Which is totally cool. You know? We've all been through this um, many, many times. I, I've, the amount of times I have been brutally rejected in order to get to the point where I can sit in most pressure um, you know, is something that you guys are going to have to go through. Whereas if you just come over and plonked yourself down and said hello to me, hey man, how are you? then you would have been able to actually chill into the set and 
to figure out what the dynamic was, where I was at in the conversation with it. And then I could have introduced you and I could have moved it around and could have, would have rolled fine. Mm. Yeah. So being able to go up to a girl, throw something out there and expect that when two strangers meet, often it's, it's strange. Yeah? It's a little bit awkward. And particularly in somewhere like London where people uh, have their guard up, um, you know, I've noticed that in going and chatting to girls, that they're certainly not as receptive as, say, they are in Sweden uh, or in Australia. Um, but that's, not, that's, that's just a minor cultural difference. That's just them responding to the stimulus of, the, of a massive impersonal city. At the heart of it, they're still women. They still like men. They still want to meet new and interesting and sexy men. And you just need to allow for the slight variations in the way that they're going to respond. So. What I'll do is I'll, I'll just throw out a couple of words and then I shut the fuck up and see how she responds. Because sometimes when you go up and I say something like that, oh, they left you to clean up. They may have just opened immediately and go, oh, yeah, I know, blah, 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 you know, we're always the ones left behind. Um, in which case, I would have been able to adjust to the energy of the situation and bring it up to where it was. But instead, if I'd gone in with some long convoluted uh, opener about horses and puking on girls and stuff like that, um, firstly, they don't hear half of it because they're just still reeling from the fact that a stranger's come up to them. And uh, secondly, I'm not actually taking an opportunity to gauge where they're at, what energy they're at, where, what their mindset is at, the pri at that time, how open they are and receptive they are to be being talked to. So instead, I wait and I see the girl go like this. Okay. Now, get used to this. I actually, I actually much prefer dealing with a girl who's, who throws attitude at me straight away than I do dealing with a really pleasant, nice girl. Because if someone who's really, really friendly to everybody, um, there's not much to lean against. There's not, uh, not so much you can create tension of. Whereas a girl who gives a little bit of attitude, I, I enjoy that. So in that situation, she went like this. And I said, oh, this doesn't happen often, does it? And again, I just wait. And I, I'm deliberately ambiguous with what I'm saying. Because I want her to question me and to come out of a shell. If there's, if there's awkwardness between two people, my definition of awkwardness is two people pretending something's not awkward. Yeah? You know you've been in that situation, say you're, you've gone to a party, you, both, uh, you know the host but you don't know anyone else, you go up and say, hey man, how you going? And he's like, hey, yeah, hey, this is my friend, and then he leaves you with some other dude. And you're like standing there like, hey, so man, how do you know the host? Yep, cool, and, um, and what do you do? Yeah, ah, oh, right, you're in a field that I know nothing about and care not, a, not at all about, yeah, awesome. And both of you are dying inside and, you know, trying to be friendly and polite and feeling this negative tension because there are different types of tension. The easiest way to get over that in any social situation is just to call it out. Yeah? If things are getting a little bit awkward, just say, is it getting awkward in here or is it just me? Because immediately what that does is, is it releases the tension. Because then we don't have to play the game anymore. There's no more expectation of us pretending to be something we're not or pretending to enjoy a situation that we don't like or whatever else it is. Yeah. So that's one thing you can, you can do. If you go up to a girl and it is awkward, that's totally fine because when strangers meet, there is, this, there is often a period of cloudy kind of uh, awkwardness, which if you sit in it and allow it to be what it is or you just call it out, it'll dissipate and then you can move on to being relaxed and normal. What I want to talk to you guys primarily today about is, is three aspects that I, that I coach guys on. Three huge, they're, they're massive areas and I, I run a 12-week, 80-hour course on this, so I can't go through all of it obviously, but I want to touch on each of these areas. Because if you only learn, and, and they are, okay, so the nuts and bolts of seduction, and in my case what I'm teaching is natural style of seduction, internal change which includes confidence, charisma, state control, uh, mindset, beliefs, whole range of things, and then lifestyle design, which is your ability to, and this includes your career, your health, the way that you dress, the interests that you have, the people you have around you, and your mission in life is, is the primary thing. Because if you don't focus on all of these three things, you'll be a very lopsided human being. If you only focus on seduction, and I know this because I did this. I, I, I reached a point where I had an incredibly interesting life. 
You know, I was a musician, I was a martial artist, I was a massage therapist. Um, I had a whole range of, of friends in all sorts of social areas because I'd spent most of my time building my lifestyle. And when I got into seduction, I got into it fucking hardcore. And I was with three other guys who were all very, very good naturals and we trained each other. And that's all we did. You know, for money, all I did was I massaged like one or two people a day. Uh, we used to seduce rich girls so that we could eat. And um, that's pretty much all we did. And what I found was that after about a year of this, I was, I was dating a girl who I'd been seeing in, a, in an open relationship for about a year, who was a fucking really cool girl. And she came to me one day and she said, uh, Jamie, uh, you're dumped. And I said, but we're in an open relationship. You can't really dump me, can you? And she said, well, whatever it is, we're not having sex anymore. And I, I always like to interview people. Like, if I get blown out from a set, I'll go back to the girl and say, before I, before I leave your life forever, I was wondering if you just might be able to give me a little bit of honest feedback. And please make sure it's honest. I, don't, I won't be offended. Just tell me what, uh, what made you, what, what repulsed you. And uh, this, is, this can be a really cool thing to do. If you guys go into a set and it doesn't work, just go back and uh, ask her to give you some feedback. Often they won't. They'll just say, oh, yeah, I don't know, I'm weird. Uh. Um, but if you, reach, but if you meet a, a switched on honest girl, she'll just tell you, yeah, when you came up to me, you stood way too close and you smell a bit funny and you asked me a weird question about a horse. I didn't like any of that. And I'm like, all right, take note. So, same thing. When you, in this situation, I was, being, uh, I was being dumped and I was like, all right, well, that, that stings. Uh, do you want to tell me why? She's like, yeah, of course. When I met you, you were an incredibly interesting person. You were focusing on spiritual development as well as being, you know, into music and, and travel and all this interesting stuff. And, you know, I, I, she, was, she was working with us in the company. She, she had no issue with it. She said, you know, I support what you guys do. I think it's really interesting. I think guys need to learn this stuff. But all you guys do every day, all day, is think, talk, and do game. And it's just fucking boring. And that's why I'm dumb here, because you become boring. And that's the only thing that ever hurts me. Like, that's, uh, that's a real insult to me. I don't being, mind being called a fucking cunt, um, if it's appropriate, but I do mind being called boring. And so I took that on board because it was really important because I had focused all my energy for a long period of time on seduction and I got very, very good at it and I could get very consistent results. But I'd done it to the detriment of my lifestyle and of my health uh, and of keeping my friendships with people and my... Uh, my family life and all that stuff as well. There was another point in my life where I was very deeply into spirituality, into self-development, um, building myself up from the core. And I, I remember I used to have a job as a bouncer at a bar. And uh, I loved that job because I got to stand there and meditate all day. Um, I would sometimes accidentally let 12-year-olds into the bar because I wasn't focusing on the other part of the job, which is stopping young people going into the bar. Um, during that time, I didn't really have a social life so much. I was quite an austere and stoic person. And uh, I was very at ease with myself. I was very comfortable. I was very confident. But I wasn't putting myself out there. Yeah. So just working on that is not going uh, to fix everything yet as either. There was also another time in my life where I was primarily a musician. And being a musician, even if you're playing like jazz flute, uh, is a good way to meet girls, for sure. There's a reason why skinny guys start bands. There's nothing to do with music. And um, so there was a time where the only way that I met girls was by getting up, playing a gig, and then when a girl went like this to me, I'd walk over and go, hi, did you like my gig? And then she might kiss me, and that was kind of my game. Um, and I reached a point where I realized that I was scared shitless of ever losing that. Like, if I didn't have a band, what would I be? Yeah, If I didn't have an unknown... Australian band that was never going to get famous, who would I be? And um, so just engineering, engineering a lifestyle just to get girls was also not the thing that was going to make me feel at ease overall. When you combine these three aspects and you're working on them at, at even levels, then your results go through the roof. And there is something to be said for at different periods you need to become reasonably obsessed about something. Okay, There's going to be points in your life when you guys, are, if you're studying, you have to just buckle down and study and your social life may suffer for a while. Um, there will be times where, as you guys are now focusing over these last four, four days, you put everything else aside and come here and go on, all right, 
I really want to get this area of my life sorted. I've come to source the, the experts in the field. We'll just you know, drop everything else and we'll wear the same underpants for four days and deal with the washing on Monday. That's what I'm doing. Uh, the uh, pity of the girl I'm going on a date with tonight. Oh, I laughed at my own joke. See, not funny anymore. Bad. Hey? She'll love it. She'll learn to like it. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to give you guys some, some concepts as well as some very practical tools uh, on each of these areas that we can go through. So they're things that you can think about because I think it's really important to look at all of this stuff from a macro and a micro level at once. If we get too into our head into, into the like, existential esoteric meaning of it all, then it becomes just sort of pontification. But you do need to look at the bigger picture and asking yourself questions like, why the fuck are you doing this? And what is the outcome that you are really after? And is it your outcome or is it an outcome that somebody has sold to you? Is really important to do. And it's important to check in on that at various points along the way because what you actually want is going to change over time. When you first get in this, I know when I first got in it, it was kind of to get revenge against the cool chicks at school. Yeah? If I'm honest with myself, that was really why I was doing it. Because they made my life miserable. The cool guys got the chicks. Fuck you. I'm going to fuck you all. And then I'll feel good about myself. Which is, was, was not a great motivation, but it, that was my motivation to start with. And over time, that shifted to, okay, I want to push my limits. I want to understand myself as a man. I want to engage with more uh, interesting, beautiful, um, challenging women. And then that kept on shifting. So I encourage you guys to, to step back fairly regularly and look at what is the big picture of this. Are you still on track heading towards your actual goals? At the same time, we, ha same time we need to look down at the micro level to the actual practicalities of how to do this. So the first one, I guess they call it inner game. Internal change, self-actualization, whatever you want to call it. Crazy voodoo, I don't know, whatever. <clears throat> the key and the core is awareness. Now, right now, I want you guys to all become suddenly aware of your ass on the seat. Can you feel your ass? Okay. Were you aware of that eight seconds previous? You facade was like, I'm always aware of my ass. <laughs> the, reason, the reason that guys get anxiety when they're approaching women, and uh, Frederick touched on this last night, which I thought was really good, um, is that they're placing a particular type of meaning on something that is, actually has no, uh, has no meaning to it. So when you guys... See the girl, we have an external stimulus that comes into us, which is like breasts and hair have arrived. We have an immediate physical reaction to that. Now, firstly, it's, it's a sense of, okay, attraction and arousal. Then if you've been into this for any length of time, you have that feeling that you must act on this and you've got to do something. And then following that comes a whole range of ideas about what if you did do that. And then you start playing all these really fucked up movies in your head about um, you know, imagining the worst possible scenario that's ever going to happen. And with, with great conviction to the point where you believe that's the actual truth. Okay, so you see the girl, she's really hot, and you're like, oh, she's going to be really fucking nasty, she's going to be a lesbian, she hates men, I look like her ex-boyfriend who beat her up, and uh, she's going to slap me and pour a beer on my head and stamp on my testicles. <laughs> yeah, or something along those lines. And then this, this, this thought pattern then feeds back into physiology, which then starts letting off all sorts of weird chemicals and you start to feel all these physical sensations, creates this feedback loop that actually sets you off into a fight and flight reflex. And when we're in fight or flight in, in, a, in this situation, what do we do? We either disassociate our mind, which is where we basically zone out and blank out, which is why guys often just feel like they have nothing to say. Yeah, they literally have nothing to say. When you guys are sitting with your best friends, do we ever run out of things to say? And guys will come to me and say, look, I just, you know, my mid-game's fucked up. I need more material in there because I need, you know, need more comfort techniques. That's not true because you guys feel perfectly comfortable talking with a whole range of people. You're quite happy sitting in silence sometimes or chatting. And the reason that you're, you're comfortable is you guys have shared language. 
you understand each other, um, and there's no particular consequences about talking or not talking. But in the situation where your adrenaline's pumping and your fight or flight has gone off, it shuts down the higher functionings of your brain, the creative aspects, the spontaneous aspects, uh, and just gets you down to like, get the fuck out of here, which is generally what we do. We make excuses about why we're not going to approach it. You know, I love this one. It's like, we're just having a guy's night. Yeah, I think, you know, tonight, fuck the chicks. It's just about me, me mate, the beer, the sport. That's all I need. And any, or there's not enough hot chicks here or whatever excuse it is that comes up in your head. One thing you can do is any, any excuse that comes up, she's probably this, she's probably got a boyfriend, she probably doesn't speak English, she probably hates me. I always just say, let's find out. And go and find that, that's, that's your mission, is to go and find out if that excuse is correct or not. Because that giving yourself that mission will actually short circuit the, the, the issue that you're having with it anyway. So, and as, as Frederick mentioned yesterday, when you have, you know, two people standing on the edge of uh, an aeroplane about to jump out, let's presume that they want to be there, they paid somebody to be there, um, and they got a parachute, then the feeling of excitement and the feeling of abject terror on a physical level is, is more or less the same. If you look at actually what's happening on the sensation level, it's the same thing. The difference is the meaning that we've ascribed to the sensation. So the best way that I've found to get over your approach anxiety is to, to cut out the, the level where you put any meaning on it and to experience it for what it actually is. So I do a lot of infield coaching, as all the coaches here do, and commonly come up against guys who are in a situation where they're like, I've got AA man, I'm, I've, I've got anxiety, look, let's just forget it. I, you can keep the money. I don't want to, I just decided that this is not for me. Women, not for me. Um, and so I'll just hold them for a second. I'll say, okay, what do you feel and where is it? And I'll say, anxiety, fear. Now that is not a feeling. That is a judgment placed on a feeling. And I'll say, no, where do you feel this fear? And they're like, I just feel fear. Okay, but it exists somewhere within your body. That's, that's the only place it can exist is within, your, within the physical framework. So if you actually check in with yourself physically and with awareness, scan through your body, you'll find the point of the fear. Often it's a tightness in your, in your throat, uh, tension in your chest, like kind of wobbly feeling in your legs, butterflies in your stomach or whatever it is. And if you actually scan through and check for the location, you'll find that there is a gross sensation somewhere. And then I get the guys to describe it in purely objective terms. And again, when I say this, okay, describe it. It's fear, it's trepidation, it's, it's, it's anxiety. Again, these are judgments. No, just what does the sensation feel like? And if you start to describe that, you'll see, okay, it's a pulsing sensation. It's, uh, you know, a lightness, a heaviness. It's heat. It's numbness, whatever it is. And when you actually get into it, then you can see, this is what my anxiety was. All it is, is a physical reaction to a set of external stimulus. And when you sit with it, what I mean present with your, with your presence, with your mind, it actually starts to unta untangle that reaction. Because there's only really one time that you can change the habits that you have. When is that? And you have to shout for the TV man. No. Now, when now? Okay, it's, it's when, it's when the, the, the habit or the, the behavior that you have is at its peak. It's when you're experiencing it. Which is why I think it's okay to, to listen to hypnotic stuff about, you know, you are always feeling calm and you love everything and there is no anxiety and all that kind of stuff. It's fine. But the time when you're really going to get over your approach anxiety is when it arises. And when, you, when, it, when it's at its peak and you step through it and you observe it for simply all, it, all that it is, then it starts to untangle and it starts to lose the power. At the same time, you get the reference experience of having stepped through it and not dying or not having anything bad happen to you. Because the problem a lot of guys have is they actually reinforce the pain constantly of the approach. Because the thing that's painful is the anticipation, right? It's like going to the gym. When you're in the gym, not that I'm obviously in the gym very much, but I have been once, and when I was there, it was fine. Uh, 
what was not fine is the feeling of like, oh shit, I've got to go to the gym and starting to make excuses. Any kind of pro procrastination creates a whole lot of pain in your, in your life. And in this situation, it creates a, more and more pain because it's something you want so badly and it is definitive of you as a man. If you're not successful with women, in whatever terms that means for you, your life will be miserable. That's, that's an you know, important thing to, to know. Unless you can get the type of woman that you would like into your life, you won't be happy no matter what. So it's serious. Yet what guys do is they get to almost the point of breaking through those little barriers where, it's, where, where the intensity of, the, of the, the pain or the anxiety reaches its peak and then just before they're about to break through it, they back off from it. And so they just practice this, the horrible bit just before they're, they're getting into their interactions or when they're in their heads you know, thinking about getting in the interactions. And so then they start to layer more and more pain around this, this whole concept to the point where often they just give up, which is, which is a really sad thing. You see guys come into this and they have the potential to access some of the best, op uh, the best knowledge that there is around. And, uh, and a lot of guys out there have no, no idea about this and never will find out about it. They won't be lucky enough to, yet they kind of squander that opportunity. So on a very, very simple and practical level, this is what I want you guys to do. When you see the girl, bring your mind and your attention to the soles of your feet. Yeah, this is a really simple thing to do because it's quite, there's always, uh, there's usually you'll feel more heat in your feet, you feel the weight of your body, and what this does on a practical level is it takes you out of your head. And you're, you're always being told, get out of your head, right? And the only way to get out of your head is to expand your awareness through your body and out into the, into the uh, environment around you. Awareness is, is the primary key to being relaxed and comfortable. If I wasn't aware of myself right now, I'd probably be starting to do this kind of stuff. Yeah? And then you guys would think what? What would you think about me? If I, that's right. Yeah. I, I, you think I'm boring? Uh, Fuck, man. Okay. And actually, just doing that for like five seconds made me feel a bit funny. Because like your, your physical reality um, affects your, your internal state and vice versa. There's a reason why that when the Chinese police catch criminals, they get them to stand like this. Yeah. Because that's the most submissive position you can put somebody in and they feel like shit, they're not going to go anywhere, all right? If you stand tall and you, and you move with purpose, then it starts to affect your internal state. But the only way to do that, because I, I do a lot of work with guys on posture and body language, when I first started out I tried to just kind of clonk them into place, you know, like okay, you stand up, like put your hips in and then like, you know, lift the heads up and you know, stick your chest out and they sort of end up like kind of this which is like sort of not right at all. The way, to, the way to actually get really, really good posture and body language is to understand on a physical level what that really, really feels like. So you have to get out of your head into your body. So when I see the girl, what I do is I project intent, which I'll talk about in a moment, and then I check, uh, I bring my attention into my feet and I trust and I move. I, don't, I have no idea what I'm gonna say. But I just, as I walk, I'm like in my feet. And so when I do open, it's inevitably much more relaxed, more slow uh, and calmer than if I'm trying to think of the perfect thing to say in that moment. And I would agree with what uh, Sasha said earlier, just say whatever's on your mind. Yeah? But don't stay too long in your mind. Don't think about what's in your mind very long. There'll be a little spark of an idea and then bring your attention into your feet and you will have presence. Because in my mind, that's what charisma is. I, I tend to have a, a profound effect on people when I meet them. It's not because I'm like, I don't know, some, the second coming or anything like that. It's just because I know myself and I'm right here, right now. And so when I engage with somebody, they feel like I really am there with them. And that's what, a, that's what everyone wants, right? Is to feel like someone, uh, that they are significant, that they're taking up space in this world, that they matter, and a woman wants that from a man. That's the, that's the sexiest thing she can feel, is to feel truly desired and wanted uh, and understood. Last year when we were, we were in LA for the PUA Summit, 
and we were told, uh, your natural shit's going to not work in LA. Um, it's just not going to work. Because over there, you got to have value, man. you got to have value. And I, I really hate the idea, the way, that, the way that the idea of value has been presented in the seduction community is really misleading. Um, someone was outside talking to me earlier, sorry, I can't remember who, and we were talking about, um, what were we talking about? I can't remember. We were talking about something and he said, oh, that's, so when you do that, when you say that with authority, it, it, it raises your value. And I didn't even know what he meant. I think the idea of raising and lowering value is, is something that will really fuck guys up in this, in this situation. Because uh, you're constantly thinking, well, hang on, did I get three more value points? Have I dropped her value a bit? You know, are we going to kind of like seesaw the value? That means nothing to me. I'm a valuable person. Everyone's fucking valuable. We are of value when we act like we are valuable. What's much more important than, you know, trying to make, essentially that's like trying to make you seem more important than she is. That's, that's what we're trying to, that's, that's the basis behind that idea. What's much more important than value is emotional impact. Is the way, is the impact that you have on someone and at an emotional core when you meet them or when you interact with them. Because when we were in LA, we were told, you know, the girls there are going to ask you, are you a producer? Do you drive a big shiny car with expensive stuff on it? And, uh, you know, I don't even drive and um, I certainly not, don't produce anything. Um, you know, we were living on a shoestring as we always are, uh, myself and my, my coaches. And we thought, oh, well, I guess we won't get laid in LA then, if that's the way it is. I remember we were in a bar and I'm, I'm talking to a girl and... I said, oh, my name's James. And she shakes my hand and looks away. And I said, excuse me, if you want to say hello to me, just look me in the eyes, please, or don't say hello. And snaps out of it in this moment and says, oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. It's just so much bullshit here. Yeah? Now, then we had a very, very real and deep uh, interaction. Because in a town like that, where everything is plastic, where people are full of shit a lot, uh, and are trying to constantly prove their value, and if they don't have it, trying to you know, lie about it or insinuate that they have more value, which is the basis of where a lot of the uh, early seduction systems were built in that city for that very reason, to try and fight at their level against their rules. And you'll always lose if you try and play the value game, because there's always someone richer and faster and more producing than you are. And I'm not interested in, in fighting on somebody else's terms. When girls would ask me, what kind of car do you drive? I said, I don't drive. As if, like, why would I dr need to drive? And then that just totally fucks up their value system. There's nothing for, there's nothing for them to judge me on, because I don't even have a car. I don't know how to drive. It's irrelevant. So tell me some more about you. What are you really into? It's the, it's the intensity of the emotional impact that you have on somebody that is going to determine uh, what they want to do with you in their, in their life. Which brings me to my second major point in terms of internal change, which is your intent. You cannot have intent without awareness, because if you're unaware of yourself, you, don't, you can't project a clear intent. But let's presume that you do have an awareness of yourself, your physicality, the way your emotions are working, and you can just sit with it without putting any subjective judgments on it, just allow it to be what it is. Then what you need to do is you need to project something out into the world. Now when we're looking at women, what we need to be projecting at the core is that I want to fuck you. Anything else is a lie. Unless, unless you really actually don't want to have sex with her and you, want to, you think she's a, a nice, slightly unattractive person, you want to be friends with her, don't project I want to fuck you because that will confuse her. Because the problem is a lot of, who here considers themselves maybe to be a nice guy? Like that they've, they've been told they've been a nice guy? Isn't that suck when a girl says you're a really nice guy because you know what's going to happen next? Yeah. No one ever says you're a really nice go guy and I'd like you to throat fuck me. They never say that, <laughs> do they? What, what I would say is that nice guys are liars actually. And they're not doing it necessarily out of, out of a need to be nice and wanting to please people and make people's lives better. They're doing it as a behavioural strategy 
to try and get what they want because that's what they've practiced. Okay, so if they're, if they're nice enough to somebody, then uh, she will hopefully see your charms at some point and you know, maybe decide that she wants to breed with you. It doesn't really happen like that. The Aussie lean is way more effective because it, the intent is clear. I want to have sex with you or I want to pass out. Yep. So what you can, guys can do is practice this. And I've been doing this all around London. It's really funny because people don't make a lot of eye contact here. But I make people make eye contact with me. Because when I'm walking down the street, I'm standing tall and like a laser beam, I'm just seeking out eyeballs everywhere. I'm trying to avoid the men's ones. Sometimes it gets mixed up, gets confusing. But I'm mainly going for the girls. And as I'm walking along, I'm just looking them dead in one eye. Because you can't look at both eyes at once. Try it. It's, it, it's weird. Okay? So you pick one eye and you just project. Think, feel, and project. I want to fuck you. I think you're hot. You're awesome. You're confident. You're cheeky. Or any variation on that. And what you do, what you'll notice is when you start doing that, walking down the street, the world changes. Girls start looking at you in a very different way. And often you'll just get all sorts of invitations because you walk past and look a girl in the eyes like, I want to fuck you. And she'll just look and stand you. And she's like, and? And then there's your approach invitation. Yeah? So when I, when I see a girl and I'm going to approach her, that's the first thing I do. I check in awareness, project my intent. Um, I'm unashamedly showing her that I'm a man, that I want to have sex with her. I don't necessarily always go up and verbally state this because in my mind, often that can just release pressure. Because when you go up and you say, you're smoking hot, I think you, oh, you know, whatever, a direct opener. Yeah, it's bold, it has an emotional impact, but at the same time, it can mean, to, she can interpret that as, well, oh, that's, that's nice, but I can have him, yeah? I'd kind of more, I, I tend to like to simmer my seductions and sometimes over long periods of time because I enjoy that, the drawn out. I, I enjoy the dance of the seduction as much as I do as having sex with a girl. Um, and so I will deliberately uh, leverage the pressure and the release on this. But the intent is always clear because even if I'm speaking about something innocuous, at the heart of it, my intent is showing her that yes, this is about sex and nothing else. Well, no, not nothing else, but that's the core of it. Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I want to blaze through a couple of practical aspects for you. Now, let's just talk quickly now about external game. If we look at the idea of qualifying, because qualifying is, is mis, sort of misunderstood. A lot of guys think that you uh, ask a qualifying question, which is like, um, you know, what's cool about you? And the girl says, I'm an artist. And they go, cool, qualified. Yeah? It doesn't, that doesn't work. That's not qualification at all. To qualify somebody, they have to firstly give a fuck about the person that's qualifying them. And there needs to be pressure on the person. They need to feel like they have to invest. That's the point of qualifying, is that when you ask the question, the qualifying question, I don't care what answer she gives me, unless she gives me an amazing answer and invests heaps, um, it's not good enough. That, that's my, that's my, the principle behind it. So I might say, what do you like? Which is one of my favorite qualifying questions. What do you like? Because it's ambiguous. Um, it could mean anything. And the girl will often say, oh, that's a hard question. Then you say, no, it's not. You just tell me what you like. And then if the hoop's too big, I can make it smaller. In bed, you know, cooking. I don't know, travel, do you like to be tied up? Give me something. And what I'll do then is I'll hold intense pressure on her. I'll just look her in the eyes because I'm quite happy to sit there for a long period of time. And she will fill that gap. So I have a very simple formula you guys can use, QCQ, question, challenge, qualify. So we pick a qualifying question. Steve's over there like giving me some kind of like Good. Roman emperor thing. Yeah, listen. Yeah. Okay, so we pick a qualifying question, can be anything. And one thing to keep in mind is you do not need to question, uh, qualify only on core values. Because if you go up into a club and go up to a girl, you know, you project the intent, you just walk up there and you're like, what is it in life that is most important to you? <laughs> that, that's a really strange thing to do. Yeah? Whereas I was in a club in Germany the other week and I did exactly that, saw the girl and pulled her in and said, who the fuck are you? Is a qualifying question. And she's like, I'm some kind of girl. And I said, you are. And we made out. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was a microcosm of the QCQ formula. Whereas if I'm sitting in the park with a girl and I say, what, what's, what's really important to you right now? Totally appropriate. Makes sense. 
So the other thing is you can qualify and totally flip and shit. You can say to a girl, are you an early riser? Hang on, what's the other one? Do you go to bed late or are you an early riser? Do you like stripes or polka dots? It can be anything, it doesn't matter. Because the point is to create the pressure. If I say, do you like stripes or polka dots? And I hold the pressure, she's thinking, I don't know which one's right. Uh, stripes. And then the C in this formula is the challenge. I will always challenge her on an answer. Really? I'm holding pressure on her and she's like, stripes? No, polka dots, definitely polka dots. When I've applied that pressure onto her and she's invested and give me what I want, what I've created is an emotional impact, emotional spike in that moment. That's the only point of the qualifying framework. And then, I won't leave it, because if you only challenge her, really, and she's like, polka dots, and you're like, fuck you. Then it's just you being an asshole. Then you need to release the pressure and reward her for uh, doing what you want, which then, of course, also trains her to uh, have good feelings every time she does something for you. Yeah, which is a bit nasty, but that's well, a bit tricky, but it works. Yeah. So then I go, awesome. I'm, I'm a striped man myself. Or actually, I'm a polka dot man, but I need someone to you know, juxtapose me. All right, let's go. Either way, it doesn't matter. So if I qualify her on something important, all right, what are you famous for? And she said, um, well, I'm a dancer. That's not good enough. Are you any good? Well, what's that about? Did you choose to do that, or did somebody pick that for you? And I just hold pressure. You need to be able to challenge people. And I do this all the time with guys as well. Last year at the PUA Summit, a guy came up to me after the talk and said, man, I really liked your talk. And I said, what did you like about it? And I'm not doing that to be an asshole. I'm doing that because that gives him a chance to engage deeply with what actually, because if I just said, thanks, man, uh, so what? I want to make sure he's got it. He's like, and I, he's holding the pressure. He's like, oh, the guru's looking at me funny. Um, and then he goes, the thing that you were talking about, about intent, really resonated with me and actually changed my perspective on game completely. I'm like, fuck yes, excellent. Yeah. When you challenge people, you're actually doing them and you a favor. Being so fucking polite actually means that you don't actually have real connections with people. Trying to, trying to make sure that the boat is never rocked uh, means that you just sail past each other. You don't, you don't actually make clear connections. I'm about in the intensity of the relationships that I have with people. That's why a girl that I sleep with once uh, in, an, in a country, and it's one thing, it's really easy to have 10 girlfriends in 10 countries, much easier than 10 girlfriends in one country. You guys should keep that in mind. And easy jet. Seriously, dudes, why are you spending your weekends here? I'm serious. If you're spending, you know, 100 pounds getting pissed in London, why not spend that on a cheap flight over to fucking Budapest, where you can live like a king and meet much, much hotter women and have awesome sex with them and then set up a girl in every city? Come on, let's think bigger here. This is lifestyle design. You want to be able to have friends and lovers and interesting experiences waiting for you all around the world. I, I do it from Australia, you know? I put in the effort. You guys, it's not, not an effort at all. Get out there and explore this world. It's much bigger than this one city, than your one social scene. Which brings me very, very briefly to lifestyle design, which is a massive topic. I can't get too far into it. But what I want you guys to think about is what is the ideal lifestyle and who are the people in it that you want to have? And think big. And you should sit down and have a think about this. I get, I get guys to do a social inventory. Write three columns, Facebook friends, contenders, inner circle. And list every single person that you know within those three categories. What I mean by Facebook friends is people that are acquaintances that you know the name of. Contenders are people who've come into your life that you share some commonalities with, that you would like to continue something with, but you haven't got a really solid connection, and you're in a circle, which is generally fairly small and static, are the people that you can always rely on. These are your long-term friends and your family, your ex-girlfriends if you treated them well, and so on. What you want to do to create an amazing lifestyle is you cannot, your acquaintances come and go, and they're, only, they're, not, uh, they're not actually going to help you much in life. You need to get people into this middle column, where they care about you and you care about them. Now, how do you make a deep connection or how do you make a deep alliance with somebody? I'll answer it rhetorically, James. You do this by creating debts and favours between you. You guys have all had those friends where you, um, you know, maybe you work together on a Friday night, you go out and you have a beer 
And then when you shift jobs, you never see that person again. You got no real connection because you made no investment and they made no investment in return. When I want to make a, a deep connection with somebody, I meet someone, I do one of four things. I ask, I offer, I trade or I collaborate. Yeah? I will deliberately put myself in debt to somebody. I'll go and ask a favour out of them and then I'll make sure that I pay them back. Because that, this trade, and I call this the seductive economy, which is a much bigger topic but we touch on it, is what creates links between people. If I was to walk up to one of you guys now, I don't have any money in my pocket so I can't do it, and said, here's 10 pounds, most people wouldn't take it. They'd be like, ooh, what is that? Because nothing's free. We're suspicious of people trying to give stuff for free. Whereas if I went up and said, if you go like this, I'll give you 10 pounds. You'd be like, that's stupid, but that's a fair deal. I'll do that. That's worth two seconds of my time. And it would make sense. Right? So what I'm always often doing with, with the people that I really want to connect with is I'm asking favours for them or I'm giving them something and then demanding something in return. And I do this in seduction all the time. Yeah? If a girl ever comes and asks me for a cigarette, I say, what tricks have you got? Let's, let's do a deal. And I don't care what it is. Whether, and often, it'll, and they, they can't think of anything. I said, all right, give me a sexy dance. And they will. Yeah? And then I'm not that idiot that's just giving stuff away. The girl comes and says, if she ever says, oh, she, you want to buy me a drink? I said, um, maybe. What are, you, what are you trading on? What do we got here? Can you moonwalk? Can you knit? Can you cook? What's it worth? Because when you trade with someone, it creates respect and trust. When you give stuff away for free all the time, uh, then it lowers your value. You know? People don't respect. That's why nice guys are actually creepy because they're always giving stuff away for free. They're giving their time. They're giving a shoulder to cry on. They are you know, buying girls stuff or whatever else it is. Not asking anything in return, but really, the girl knows she's accruing a debt that he's saving up for a time where he's going to kind of sneakily go, actually, I wrote you this poem. I've been in love with you for four years. Yeah? That's actually creepy, and it's, it's a lie. Whereas the, the out and proud Aussie leaner, it comes in and goes, this is all about the root, is, is quite clear about what the trade is. Yeah? So what I suggest to you guys is that in your interactions with, girl and with, with girls and with people in general, is that you, you trade with them. Yeah, you, you have to expect stuff out of people in return for what you give. And you need to do that on a personal level to value your own time, who you are. And I'm not saying be mercenary about it, you know, like working out every cent on a coffee with somebody or anything like that. Keep in mind there are multiple currencies being traded at all times. In your lifestyle, you need to be able to trade different things. There's a guy here who's putting, up, putting me up for the week. It costs him zero. He's got a couch. I get to sleep on it. That doesn't cost him anything. But for me, that's really valuable because that saves me 100 pounds a night having to be in a small, expensive London hotel. And I get the experience of hanging out in a, in a house in London, which is more fun than being in a hotel. So I owe him, and I know that. Yeah? What you want to get to the point of is if you, if you want to have an amazing lifestyle, is you want to have a currency that's worth a lot to other people and cheap for you to give away. So in that in situation, I suggest that you guys do trade on stuff that's easy to give away. Just throw it out there and then expect stuff back in return. Because then I come home after this and I'll sit down with him and I'll give him some fucking amazing seduction advice which is, worth, which is cheap for me to give away but very, very valuable for him. And in that way, we become friends and we bond because we took a risk on each other. So what I want you guys to do is think about what is your ideal lifestyle? Do you know these people? And if not, take step back a notch and go, who knows these people? You guys want to hang out with models and have sex with them maybe? Some people do, let's say. You don't know any models. Who do you know that knows models? Who knows models? Photographers, makeup artists, promoters, um, all sorts of people. And then you can target these people. If you don't know them, then you step back another level and you start targeting them. And you may think, well, what have I got to offer these people? At the end of the day, the thing that's worth the most, the currency that's most valued on this planet, is human emotion and the exchange of it. If you can look somebody clearly in the eye, if you can ask them how they feel about stuff, what's really important to them, you can engage with them on the emotional level, then they love you, then they want to be around you, then they respect you. You do this with women, which is why, I mean, so many guys stay on details, right? They ask detailed questions. Anytime you're collecting facts in a conversation with a girl, it's bad. 
If you're learning something, it's bad. All right? How many, how long, that this kind of thing. When I sat down with those girls the other day, I said, okay, so you guys are studying. And they're like, yeah. And they're getting ready for me to say, and what are you studying? And what year are you in? And all, and detail, detail. And I said, are you guys good students? Do you procrastinate? Are you lazy? And they're like, what? Because I'm immediately taking the topic, which is the study, and getting down to how they relate to the topic in terms of who they are as a person. That's what I'm always doing. When I'm picking a topic, if, I'm, if I've had a long conversation about the topic, the third person topic, then that's not a good interaction. I only ever use the topic as a bouncing off point to find out about what kind of person they are. So whenever you ask, ask a question about a topic, it's fine. You can ask a question about a normal topic. You can ask, what do you do? I don't like to, but you can. And she says, I'm an accountant, whatever. She says, I'm in, I'm in advertising. I'll immediately say, do you love it? Or are you doing it for the money? Or something like that. And then she says, yeah, I'm doing it for the money. I'm like, you cold-hearted bitch. All right, awesome. So when you have all that money, how are you going to spend it? The, 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 the job was only ever a doorway to me to find out about how she operates as a person. Yeah. OK, so I want to I wanna open it up for questions in a moment. But I want you guys to just keep these key points in mind. It starts with awareness. Put your mind in your feet. When, whenever the excuses come up, any of this stuff that's going on buzzing around your head, you can't think your way out of it. Don't try to. Just allow yourself to feel what's going on within your body. And any time those words that, of judgment come up, change them to just descriptive words. What does it actually feel like without a, without a judgmental meaning on top of it? Project your intent. Whenever you see the girl, because the, the approach starts well before, she, often before she's even seen you. Yeah, It's certainly well before you've opened your mouth. Because if you're thinking about it and you haven't figured out your intent, by the time you get up to her, she's felt that negative pressure. And people want to get away from weirdness and awkwardness. Yeah? Whereas if it's like, feel my feet, want to fuck you, and I'm walking up and I'm just feeling and present, that's when magic really happens. That's where you have those movie moments where the girl's like, what is that? Because they don't get to feel that very often. They don't get to feel men coming up with that kind of presence. It's not, it's not so difficult to do. It's actually, sim it's actually much simpler than trying to have some convoluted game plan. When you get into your conversations, make sure you're challenging her on many levels. And I don't mean being a dickhead about it. Don't just, uh, yeah, whatever. Oh, yeah. Don't stack challenges. And a challenge can be anything from a, a raised eyebrow. So she gives you an answer and you're like, or just silence. Because when you hold silence, people tend to fill it. Through to a really simple and soft challenge like, why? Well, what's that? Tell me more about that. What's behind that? You'll have to explain. Through right through to if you've got a girl with heavy attitude and you're like, what's cool about you? She's like, I'm a dominatrix, so I could beat the shit out of you. And we're like, fuck you, you're lying. Don't mess with me. I will need to challenge her on that level. Yeah, because if I do a soft challenge on her, it's not going to work there. Whereas if I do that to the nice girl, I'm like, what's interesting about you? She's like, I like dancing. Fuck you, you're lying. Uh, <laughs> she's, gonna, she's just going to cry. Right? That's why I use a lot of silence. I don't speak very much. I'm a very low energy seducer. And a lot of guys who get into this are introverted and low energy. And that's totally fine. Uh, in fact, in my opinion, seduction tends to happen in low energy. It's when things tone, you know, turn down but heat up. So I'm not a high energy guy. I'm not extroverted. Uh, I'm grumpy often. Um, but that really, really works for me because I own it. And I project very, very clear intent about who I am to the girl. So if you guys don't think you have to be you know, like Vince Kelvin, who is one of my favorite speakers and a very good friend of mine, and when we go out together and wing together, it's, it's quite hilarious because it can't get any more extreme than the levels of low and high energy. But it both works because that's who we are and we're just expressing um, the energy level that we feel comfortable with. Yeah? But at the same time, always challenge the people that you're with. Allow silence to sit because people tend to fill it and women speak more than us anyway. And at the same time, be working on your ultimate lifestyle. And don't, be, don't buy into the bullshit of working eight hours a week for the rest of your life, making yourself go grey early uh, in order to maybe one day have that car or that house or that watch or whatever that's then going to maybe mean you're going to get the girl. That's all bullshit. I've taken gorgeous girls off guys who are far richer and you know, more successful than I will ever be in those value terms because I'm trading on the currency that's most important in life, which is the human emotion. 
you guys can look people in the eyes, ask them questions about who they really are, and allow them to express themselves to you, they will love you. They will want to fuck you. They will want to help you. I have two rules in seduction. One of them is the right to freedom rule. Make no apology and take full responsibility. Make no apology for who you are, what you want, what you're trying to achieve in this life, but take responsibility for the fact that you have to be the one to go out there and make it happen. If you allow external circumstances, your height, your race, your age, you know, the last uh, thing that happened to you when you approached a girl or any of these things to hold you back, then you are a prisoner of external circumstances. So take responsibility for the fact that you're going to have to go out there and face this over and over again and you will get smashed sometimes, you will get uh, you know, your ego shattered, which is a great thing. I love getting my ego shattered by girls because it makes me reappraise constantly over and over again who I actually am. Because every time I think I know who I am, some girl or some circumstance comes along and smashes it and then I get to uh, recreate myself. This, uh, this journey, seduction, in my mind is, uh, is an amazing catalyst for personal change if you choose to take it that way. It can become something that turns you in a twist, into a twisted weirdo. And I've seen many guys go down that path. Please don't let that happen to you. But if you, you do it in the right way, it allows you to grow in all directions, spiritually, financially, in your social world, sexually. Because a woman, a good woman, will act as a mirror to you. When held up, she will show you your flaws and she will show you the power in yourself that you didn't even know you had yet. If, you were, if you're actually able to be honest and authentic with her. Don't try and pre pretend to be somebody you're not, but be very, very willing to explore and expand who you thought you were. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I really appreciated the speech. Uh, I watched the whole thing and uh, even have to go to the bathroom very bad. But uh, I want to, like, you're talking about this stuff that has to do with presence, that has to do with, uh, you know, talking to people. And I think excellent talking about the challenge and nobody talks about this and how to do it. But what I want to ask you, and I think this is really important for me to hear too, is what is your end goal of that challenge? Just like you just said, seduction for you, a woman will humble you, a woman will, a good woman will change you and actually challenge you and bring up fears. What would be the end result that <clears throat> we should all be looking for if we are following this path from Okay, do you, do you mean in terms of challenging within that small context or, or overall? Uh, the small context, but mainly to the overall challenge. Okay, well, I love to be challenged by, by, by women and people as well. Um, I think when you, when you step out there, because inevitably when you start challenging women, they'll challenge you back. And, and women do this all the time anyway. They start poking at men to see what they're made of because they have to. They have to screen men based not necessarily on what's first given to them, but what happens when they poke at them. Which is why guys, I don't know why guys get all upset about what they call shit tests. I love them because it gives me an opportunity to demonstrate to the girl who I actually am. Um, the, point, the point of challenging is that it gets to the heart of the matter. It gets to the reality of what's actually happened. I don't, the, the first answer that somebody gives you without any pressure on them is going to be the, the one that they got to through the path of least resistance. They're going to give you as little as they have to. T people tend to do that unless they really want to impress you for some reason. So what I want to do in that situation is I want to allow her the opportunity to show me more of who she is. And I demand it, actually. And in the same way, I want her to do the same to me. You know, I was out the other night and I was talking to a girl and she just looked me dead in the eyes and said, do you like music? Not in like that way of like, what kind of music do you like? It's like, are you serious about music? And I found myself in that moment going, I'm really passionate about music. Music's really important. And before I'd noticed it, I'd realized she challenged me in exactly the way that I would usually do it and it had that effect where I actually gave more of myself because I felt the pressure because she was expecting more. People who expect more out of life get more. That's basically it. If you want more out of life, you've got to challenge and expect more. And there's just one more thing. What would be your end goal of this? Like what is... Uh, in seduction? Yeah, because we talked about this last night and I know you have like, it's really impactive things yeah, that yeah. you say. So. Well, for me, it's a, it's a, it's a constant evolution. <clears throat> You know, I, I mean, my personal story is pretty wacky, but I've been through a whole lot of different um, 
lives and experiences within seduction, from being you know, a monogamous guy to uh, suddenly going, all right, I want to have sex with as many girls as possible, to going, all right, what I want to do is I want to experiment with some relation par relationship paradigms that are writ out there. So I wanted to have five insanely hot, insanely challenging girlfriends all at once who all knew about each other. That, at some point, that was my thing. And I worked very hard and got to that point. I don't necessarily suggest uh, it's pretty hard to juggle that kind of thing. Um, I didn't have time for anything else, but I wanted to push it and see what the extremes were. And I learned a lot about myself and a lot about women during that, during that phase. I then reached a point where I met one fucking amazing woman who blew all the others away and challenged me on a level that I had never experienced before. And, you know, there, there will come times in your seduction career where you'll need to make choices about, is this serving you anymore? If you've got to the point where you are getting regular sex with lots of different girls, which I don't, I'm not going to say don't go through that, it's for sure, go through it, check it all out. Um, but there will come a time where you're not learning anything more because of that. And then you need to recognise when it's time to evolve to a new or a different level. And I notice that, you know, men who get into this go through arcs of, of development. Going from inactive single, which is where some of you will be and you never want to be, which is where you're celibate and you don't want to be celibate. That sucks. Uh, all the rest are legitimate. Actively single, which is where you're choosing to be single, but you get to experience sex on whatever level it is that you want. You know, having multiple relationships um, that are ethical, that are honest and open, which is really easy to do. Uh, a lot of guys are always like, how do you have more than one girlfriend with, you know, you have to lie, right? No, you don't. You just need to be really clear about it from the very beginning and accept that uh, some girls won't be cool with it. I would just used to say that, look, I want to tell you where I'm at. Um, I'll, I'll understand if you're, if you're not okay with it. When you put it like that, a lot of girls will be cool with it. So for me, it's, there is no end goal. Like uh, I'm continuing to evolve in this. If, there was, if I felt there was an end goal, I would get out of this business completely. I would move on to something. I'd go back to Shaolin Temple and sit in the monastery, which I may end up doing. Maybe that's my, my whole journey. Um, seduction is a big part of the hero's journey. Feeling like you're alive, like you're a man, like you have a masculine presence, like you have a purpose in life. There's got to be a woman along, or many women along that, that path. But at the same time, don't let that for too long become your path, unless you're going to end up like us. Yeah, because that gets crazy. Yeah. All right, what else? Yeah. You were talking about... Um, I'll get the mic. You were talking about, um, you know, always asking questions, um, but something I learned on a... I didn't. I never said always oh, ask questions. Oh, oh, sorry. Ask. You did say um, that we should ask questions. That's part of conversation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah something I. Uh, something I learned on a, another seminar was um, that the person who asks the questions is always in control. In control of what? The um, uh, the situation. Okay, I don't agree with that. Okay, well, okay, we'll but I mean, well, okay, I, well, what's the what's the point you're getting at here? Like, what do you what's your question for me? I'm saying that um, you know it's about uh, leading, isn't it, and being yeah. in control of the situation. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to let a girl lead, like, and there's there's different ways to lead. Uh, okay, so like I travel a lot, right? So I, I rock up in cities where I don't know where the fuck I am, and I get lost just walking out my own door. I'm, I've got a terrible sense of direction. Um, Okay, so for example, I'm going on a date tonight and with, a, with what you would consider to be a very high value girl, very attractive and successful and so on, and uh, we're shooting texts back and I'm like, I have no idea where to take her. I can't, I can't say, well, I think we should go to, uh, I don't know, anywhere. So I'm chatting and I'm saying, all right, I think we should, we should, uh, we should meet at seven, but you're going to have to take the lead on where. Yeah? So I'm actually leading her to lead me. Say if I go back to a girl's house, um, I can't lead her to the bedroom because I don't know where it is. Yeah? So I'll say, all right, give me the tour. Let's go. And I'll push her to, like, take me. I'm being led. Yeah? You can, you can lead people in all sorts of ways by getting them to ask you questions or you asking them questions or whatever. It's really about how you steer the overall um, aspect of the conversation. I think it's very, very... It's way too arrogant to, to presume that. And girls see through arrogance very quickly. Or if they don't, then, then they're not that well socialised. Um, feeling like you know you always need to be in charge and you know if, if she asked you a question and she's kind of leading the, the conversation for a while that you're losing power and all that it's not true 
if a girl wants to like expand on something or explore ideas with me or wants to challenge me on something, I'm totally cool to let her do that because I'm confident, I'm not arrogant. You know, I've got nothing, I actually don't have anything to prove. I, I'm, I'm happy with who I am and I know that I, I tend to get what I want and if for some reason she doesn't like me, well, I can live with that. Yeah? So I wouldn't worry so much about that. Yes, you want to be leading the overall tone and you want to be thinking about where the interaction is headed. Okay, what's the point? If you're just sitting there and like chatting randomly, floating around, nothing's happening, then yeah, you need to take leadership. Um, but if for a while she's getting all animated and she's probing into you, well, cool, that's, let her do that. And that will demonstrate good things about you. It shows that you don't have anything to hide, that you're willing to let a woman, you know, see what you're actually made of. And then if it starts, you know, then at some point you shift it back and go, all right, let's get the fuck out of here. Or let's do something and you start to move it around and lead it. Does that make sense? All right, one more, we're done? All right, thank you very much, gentlemen.